This is Net Video. I'm Jason Romney. We're in Sydney, Australia, and we're talking to one of Australia's greatest playwrights and screenwriters, Stephen Saul. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Jason. Stephen, there's been a lot of controversy in the area of Hanny Rayson's latest play. What are your thoughts about the state of play creatively in those areas today? Um, I'm uh, very happy, you know, that. Uh that there's a lot more political work and a lot more um, uh, work dealing with the, uh, the issues of the time or dealing with the realities, really, of, the, of, of where we are than there, than there used to be. And Hanny's play, obviously, is, is one, of, uh, one element of that. Uh, she was uh, very, very successful in stirring a, <laughs> a mad controversy, so she got up a, a few people's noses. Pitbulls uh, of the right-wing press savaged her, coming out <laughs> of their caves, baying for blood, like I, uh, I few playwrights have been able to... Uh, uh, generate. Well, that's what I thought. What did she I thought, do right? Yeah. Well, um, I think that what she, obviously what she did was uh, um, name names. You know, she did the equivalent of naming names. And I think when the when Brecht, uh, sorry, when um, when the controversy when when we became aware of the controversy here in here in Sydney, um, I instantly thought of Brecht's line: "The na- the um, the enemy has a name, a face, and an address." And um, I guess in one way, one of my failures as a writer is, is to not to not provide the name, the face and the address, but to give a, a more generalised account. Do you I, think that has anything to do with the fact that you're here today <laughs> and not at the bottom of the bay in concrete booths? <laughs> well, very likely, yeah. So tell us about what you're working on at the moment. Many things, actually. Um, uh, my play, Myth, Propaganda and Disaster, uh, in Nazi Germany and Contemporary America, is about to have its first American production premiering at the Edinburgh Festival, and with the idea of that then going to Broughton to West End and then on to Broadway. Uh, so we're about to leave for Edinburgh to uh, to see that, so that's very exciting. It's a play that deals with a, um, an Australian academic who is living and working in New York, and he has written a, a, a monograph, and the monograph is called Myth, Propaganda and Disaster in Nazi Germany and Contemporary America, a Comparative Study. And when the authorities discover the name of, the, of, uh, of his monograph, um, he begins to be subjected to a, a sort of detailed persecution, um, concluding with his, with his murder. Uh, I mean, it sounds like a comedy, and, uh, and uh, a lot of it is very comic, in, in a black comic way, blackly comic way. Um, one, but uh, I mean, in the context of the um, bombings, uh, the recent uh, London bombings, um, a one of the lines keeps ringing in my ear, which is, or in my mind, big pardon, which is um, uh, in, in a discussion with a with a friend of his, uh, where he 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 sort of talks about the attacks on civil liberties and the. Um, uh, the erosion of, um, of straightforward legalities like uh, innocent until proven guilty. Um, the, uh, the friend says to him, I don't think that anyone really cares about those sorts of things anymore. All they want to do is not to be sitting next to a, a suicide bomber. And that, of course, is where we're all at now. And that's sort of one of the reasons why this, um, this terrible uh, panic is, uh, is setting in where it looks like massive uh, areas of our normal liberties, what would be re- understood to be normal liberties, are about to be uh, bulldozed over the, over the edge, all for the sake of um, uh, so-called uh, uh, safety. But people, aren't, people are not going to be safer once we've kind of handed our liberty over to the, over to the government. Um, it's an interesting psychological situation that it's very easy to compartmentalise away starving children, for example, or to uh, feel in line with those young men who sat at the bottom of uh, nuclear weapon silos that when you pressed the button, you weren't personally responsible for the fact that what was launched was going to kill millions of people. Mm. So to, to compartmentalise and separate yourself from responsibility or danger is, is very possible there. But when it comes to suicide bombers, as you've just said, it's a far more penetrative fear, a far more uh, insinuating and, and uh, strangely haunting fear, very much on your personal doorstep at all times. How is that kind of psychological state affecting the creative arts, film and theatre? Um, I think it's too early to, to, to tell yet. 
um, because it's it's still a little a little abstract. I mean, the, in the, this the recent bombings in in London, of course, are, are quite uh, have been quite shocking for people. But in, in the, probably in the way that the IRA bombings uh, w- were shocking, in the sense in, in the sense that, as you just said, you know, it can now happen anywhere. It can now happen to you, to me. It can now happen to people that I love. I think. Uh, Probably in that context, uh, the, the best way of, or the, the most uh, appropriate way of looking at it, would be the arts in uh, in Israel, or or even the arts in um, uh, in the uh, in London and Ireland at the time of the um, IRA crisis. And I guess uh, Israeli artists are. Um, I, I heard this fantastic uh, writer talking about how the only place he felt safe in Israel was when he went to the beach. Because everyone was naked, mm. and I think that that's a that's a solution to this crisis that no one's kind of really suggested yet <laughs> that we all take our clothes off. <laughs> um, so, I've, I guess I you know I got the first inclination the other day. I was talking to an artist, talking to a theatre person, and they expressed for the very first time that I could remember a fear uh, for themselves that maybe they shouldn't be doing the kind of work that they've been doing. And I tried to say absolutely not. You know, now is now is the time uh, to continue the continue our work of uh, of humanising each other. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, I think one of the great strengths or the strength of, of theatre is uh, that the audience comes to recognise that everyone on stage is a human being just like they are, and that we can through the, through the art through the art of theatre enter the world of the other. Um, and as you say, uh, for most of us, the, the word terrorist is a, is a simple category that uh, that's, uh, that prevents us from um, identifying or understanding or questioning their motives or, or their purposes, mm. their reasons, you know, why they're doing it. Um, but theatre is a place where you can, can enter it. And once I think you, once you recognise that, you know, you also recognise how close our own culture is to suicide bombers. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in—I um, grew up as a Catholic, and I was continually taught by the Catholic priests that I would, uh, and, the, and the Catholic nuns, that I would, um, I would one day, if I was lucky, be required to martyr myself uh, for the faith, and that was absolutely part of uh, part of my um, part of my culture and part of my ex- expectations of life. You probably know yourself that um, that the only reason the uh, like that in, at the early part of the, the Christian uh, religion in the first and second centuries, um, uh, Christians were absolutely you know they were presenting themselves to be martyred to uh, to whoever would you know be, do the do the deed for them. Mm. And the only way that uh, that they were stopped was when a, a, an official church edict was was made that um, that you couldn't do it. It was a sin mm. <laughs> to seek out martyrdom. So, mm. so this crisis of, uh, of martyrs is something that has happened in, in the Christian church as well. It's interesting that um, in the same way that a lot of science fiction from the 50s, for example, like the invasion of the body snatchers and so on, was seen as a metaphor for the communist threat yeah. uh, and the psychologically uh, subtle ways in which uh, otherwise uh, decent Americans could be beguiled by the evil left-wing ideologies, um, we now have the Islamic... Uh, revolutionary and martyristic mind frame apparently being created in London-born young people who are then able to, even though it must be an immensely intense psychological core to have the power to kill yourself for your cause, but they're able to hide that and grow up in London without that being even guessed at by their closest friends or family, Mm. maybe. Mm. That's an amazing psychological phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah, yes, and a, and, and a terrifying one, of course, that, that the person next to you, whom you th- think you know intimately, you don't know at all, and maybe a murderer. You know, that, I suppose that's a central kind of the fear of, of, of the present now. Of course, ironically, it was the exact opposite for your character, the academic in the United States, who wasn't actually a threat, but was perceived to be a threat, even though he wasn't. So that's the other side of the coin, isn't it? Well, I think that uh, I suppose my kind of attitude to I, I, I feel that the debate is being uh, deliberately manipulated um, in such a way as to uh, to make us um, abandon uh, very kind of 
centuries old kinds of um, understandings of, of how our society works and how we work within a society uh, and to hunt us into a, 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 a very kind of, um, well, in, into a police state, um, essentially. And uh, I'd, like the details of, uh, of what the terrorists are and what the terrorists want and, and, and how we can protect ourselves from the terrorists, I think like once we get into that sort of that, that, that kind of debate, that kind of argument, um, I don't see a way out of it really. You know, like it, it's, it's blatantly clear to me um, that the terrorist crisis is not going to be solved by police. You know, it's absolutely not going to be solved by police. And, um, and even if the case came that every single one of us got locked up at, uh, locked up at night um, by the local policeman, um, there would still be acts of terrorism taking place because human beings are sufficiently smart uh, and that given any amount of time, they can do anything that they want. You know, so, I mean, these terrorists could wait five, you know, five days, five months, five years to get, get their targets and, and, and find a way of doing it, and they will. Um, and it doesn't matter what uh, what precautions we take. It's, it's you know the, when you look at the this recent uh, the recent bombings. All I mean all of the uh, cameras in in London and all of the incredible um, uh, incredibly skilled and incredibly powerful police forces and uh, and military forces and intelligence forces that are available to the uh, to the um, to the to the English didn't stop them. Didn't didn't stop them, couldn't stop them, um, and now this sort of plethora of, of new legislation and new whatnot, you know, to 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 deal with the crisis, that's mm-hmm. not going to stop them either, because it's not in that area uh, that it needs to be stopped. I was thinking, and there's a, there's a kind of way in which the argument then then gets turned back on someone like me, and and uh, and you know you you kind of uh, you put in a position where it appears that if you're critical of the of the uh, of the uh, if, you know if if you even ask what the motivations of these people are, that's somehow a surrendering to uh, to terrorism. But I think the terrorists themselves, the terrorists in the way that they're talking, make it very very clear what they what they want. They want people out of Iraq. They don't want American Iraq. They don't want the UK and Iraq, and they don't want Australia and Iraq. And it's the countries that that uh, that are in Iraq that are getting terrorised, not the countries that are not in, not in Iraq. Um, you know, I think that's kind of if if we listened to uh, to what they're actually saying, um, rather than uh, just immediately uh, uh, immediately going into a into a kind of teleological religious argument argument about the end of the world and uh, sanity and rationality versus um, uh, madness and chaos. Mm-hmm. You know, if we actually kind of started to become a little bit rational about this, it might it might clear up rather quickly. I was thinking the other day, if you walked on a, onto a, an ant's nest um, and, uh, and uh, after you started to get bitten, you, you said, no, I'm staying here to teach the ants a lesson. You know, that would be a, 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 a very kind of rash thing to do, and I think that's, that's the kind of um, position that, that our leaders are taking. And um, you can only expect that... I mean, when the Prime Minister, when the Australian Prime Minister says that he thinks that it's inevitable or that he can't rule out... Uh, that there'll be an attack on Australia. What sort of leadership position is that? Does that make me feel safe? No. Hmm. In terms of these issues, how are they now being fed into your work? I guess the... Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, I feel very strongly that, that, uh, that we are in a, in a state of great crisis. Uh, political, international political crisis, the crisis of democracy, um, the crisis of the rule of law, um, the crisis, it's a, it's a generalised crisis and a, and a quite a frightening one, within a, within a much more frightening crisis, which is the ecological crisis. So that, that um, there are many, many reasons now for, for people to start paying attention to, to what's going on, if they want to survive, really, you know, if they want to survive, if they want their children to survive. Um, yesterday, you might have noticed that the uh, um, the the, um, f- uh, the environmental, the federal environmental uh, leader, uh, uh, minister in Australia, released a report, a CSIRO report, um, de- looking at at, at uh, what global warming will do do to Australia in terms of uh, droughts and and uh, you know chronic failure of the mm. uh, of the uh, of the environment. And in his in, in releasing the report. Um, he said that people shouldn't panic. 
that we shouldn't panic, that these changes that are being talked about in the CSIRO document will only take place in 30 to 50 years. Well, I hope to be still alive in 30 years, and I hope my children are still alive in 30 years. So I think it you know, very much is a time to panic. Not to panic and, uh, and uh, you know, act irrationally, as we are being sued onto by, by the, the present government in terms of the, of, the, um, in, of the political crisis, the terrorist crisis, but a time to panic in terms of uh, thinking very, very clearly and very, very hard about uh, what's, what sort of what we want now, what we want in terms of, uh, of our politics and what we want in terms of our, of our environment. Um, so, and I, I, and I see that absolutely as part of my, part of the material of my work. You know, I, I work as a, as a writer, as a, as a playwright and a, and a screenwriter, um, with the, with the understanding, with the philosophy that, that what my, what I'm doing is communicating to, uh, to my countrymen and, and internationally, um, the concerns of our, of our times. I'm not here and I'm not part of a, I, I was never intended and, and haven't become part of a, an anodyne uh, anesthetizing uh, cultural apparatus to tell everyone that everything's okay. Um, I was thinking yesterday that uh, because I've been, have been thinking a little bit about propaganda lately, you know, because there's so much obvious propaganda around. Um, but but there's a deeper kind of propaganda, and I think that the, the core propaganda is a propaganda that tells you that the unthinkable is normal. That's the propaganda that um, that. Uh, is the most that, that that is endemic. We we live within a propagandized society that has now kind of suddenly been shocked out of it, out of its slumber, its induced slumber by uh, by uh, terrorists saying um, get out of our face and get out of our our world. Uh, but but you can almost immediately see the machine kind of moving around and trying to normalise that. Mm-hmm. So that I guess you know you, in that um, Terry Gilliam film uh, Brazil, there was the the, the kind of the, the, uh, 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 it depicted a society that I feel we are becoming. That is the society um, where bombs go off in restaurants and uh, emergency services arrive and and cart the bodies out and uh, and clean the mess up even as people are sitting and dining and choosing their their meal a, a, a sort of a new anesthetic a new level of um of uh, of dullness in, into ourselves and and i guess i want to be i don't i don't want to be part of the anesthetic i don't want to be part of the slumber party i want to be part of the uh, i want to be part of the solution mm. you know and, and i think a very a, the, the very first sort of step of the step in the solution is to recognize the problem in its in its reality of course, the uh, conception of Brazil, I suppose, began with George Orwell's 1984, mm. with the nation continually in war. Um, and, of course, if you follow these things through, it ends up as a, a battle of ideas in which the kind of works that you produce are hopefully going to be some kind of counterpoint to the mass culture sort of simplicities of a 24 series. Uh, because... When you, you mentioned, for example, consumption and how an, an unregulated free enterprise marketplace which enables conspicuous consumption to develop to the max so that an awakening giant like China has everyone working on a consumer model which uses up the world's resources. And when you get into discussions with people, you realise all of a sudden that, well, they don't actually care because they might be, say, an American born-again Christian who thinks the world's going to end with a rapture anyway, so it doesn't matter that everything's like that. Mm. And then you realise that there's such a a chasm between your worldview and theirs that you're never going to come together. And these chasms now exist across so many fronts, not just religious, but, you know, so many areas. And those are the the fissures or the the, uh, flashpoints that are rearing up in terrorist acts all over the world. Mm. And when people look at that, they think, well, there's no hope. Mm. But I Mm. suppose another important function that your work has to play is not only illuminating these issues, but fostering some sense that there is grounds for hope. Mm. How are you doing that in your current work? (laughs) Uh, I I think at, at, um, at a very primitive level, at the very kind of base level, uh, you know, the ability to face the demon uh, or the demons or face reality um, indicates some hope, you know, or, or, or is itself a hopeful 
a hopeful event. It's the people who are hiding in, in, a, in a world of fantasy um, who are the hopeless and who are the despairing. They're the ones, um, you know, who, uh, who don't want to look because they're too frightened. Um, I think the people who want to look and, uh, and, and face it have the hope that it can, in, just in, in that act, you know, have a, uh, indicate that, there's a, that there is a future, that there is hope. Um, but I think that there's something kind of more than that. Uh, um, and I guess I'm... Uh, I, I, I can't say that I'm completely hopeful. Um, I, I, I certainly know that... Um, you know, in the destruction of the United Nations, for example, um, I think that there was a, a, a one of the one of the last levers that we had to save ourselves um, was demolished, and I think that to, to me that that's a bigger crime actually than the uh, than the murder of all those Iraqi people, um, because. I fear that it's a little bit like being on the Titanic and watching the captain running around putting holes into the lifeboats. That's what I think the destruction of the United Nations was about. Um, so I think that there are, there are a, a very good grounds for, um, for um, not having hope and for fearing that, um, that, that what lays ahead, what lay ahead of us would be a kind of a, a, a perhaps faster version of what happened on the Easter Islands once all the trees were gone there. Um, and, you know, descend into madness and cannibalism. Um, but I guess the, you know, there's a there's a vestigial sort of hope that one has as a human being that uh, that there are so many valuable things in life and so many good things in life that you just hope against hope <laughs> that um, that you know that, that we're going to sneak through somehow. We're going to mm. we're going to um, do it again. Mm. Your early plays, there are many of them, have come onto the curriculum of secondary school students um, across Australia. Do you uh, talk with those students and thereby perhaps get a sense of what the young people are thinking and how they're reacting to your work? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, I mean, generally you'd have to say that young people are very very thoughtful and very concerned and very uh, and very aware of what's going on and and you can remember yourself as a you know as a school kid or a, a young person that, that that's the time you know when you really sort of you 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 start taking on deck all the like the moral systems and the the values that your parents have taught you and apply it to what you actually see the world to be and that's a a period of crisis typically of of why is and why you know why if it's if it's wrong to lie, why are these liars in power? Like that's that's a uh, that's the period when uh, when those kinds of questions are, are I, I think most uh, are at their sharpest. Um, at, at the same time, I, I'd have to say that uh, that the the Bali Nine, for example, those young people um, and their sort of uh, their very kind of um, uh, you know, their, their stupidity, basically, I suppose, is, is, is and their ignorance of the world is, it seems to be very much a, a, a kind of a new phenomenon, I think, in Australia. Um, in, and and I, I guess I, I would blame, and I, I don't know how fair this is, it's probably very unfair, or many people would think it would be very, very unfair, but I think that the Bali Nine are very emblematic of, of, of Howard's Australia. You know, how, what, what's, what's John Howard done to the Australian education system? He's basically demolished it. What's he done to the manufacturing industry? He's demolished it. Um, these, these young people know nothing about their, uh, you know, in, in the Bali Nine um, case, uh, appear to know nothing about Indonesia, nothing about international law, or, or about Indonesian law, um, and uh, essentially working in call centres um, for, uh, for terrible wages. The, you know, it's, it's a kind of white trash Australia, Mahathir said that Australia would be the white trash of, uh, of Asia, and under John Howard, this appears to have happened. Stephen, one of your best known uh, theatrical works, Sisters, is now a movie. Can you tell us what's happening there? Uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy to, to say that, um, that I've finally been able to kind of... Uh, Get it together, get the get the, the movie together. We now have a, a, a UK uh, coach and partner, Parallel Pictures, 
and uh, I'll be shooting the uh, shooting the film in the Isle of Man in March uh, 2006 uh, with Jacqueline McKenzie and um, and uh, Stellan Skarsgård. For people who haven't seen it, what's it about? Uh, sibling rivalry taken to an extraordinary length. <laughs> The, the the byline the log line for the movie is did you ever want to kill your sister? <laughs> <laughs> it's always very uh, uh, satisfying to hear a master pitcher at work. <laughs> Stephen Saul, thank you very much for coming on Net Video today. Thanks very much, Jason. Mm-hmm.